Tonight, we're in the nation's capital where two major political stories are developing. Joe Biden's first official visit as U.S. president. One agreement on a major source of tension between the two countries. Will there be others? And the mounting pressure for a full public inquiry after a liberal MP resigns for allegations of Chinese government interference. All those in favor of the motion will please rise. So a big political night, and we have that issue here to break it all down. How companies charge women more than men on a whole range of products. $6.99, 24 caplets. What do you got over there? 24 caplets, $7.49. A CBC Marketplace investigation into the so-called pink tax. This is The National in Ottawa with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Welcome to Ottawa, where heavy fog has been moving in and out all evening. But there is hope there will at least be clarity in the conversations. Security in this city is very tight, anticipation very high, because, of course, U.S. President Joe Biden is here for his first official visit to Canada since taking the job. The Bidens arrived this evening for their roughly 28-hour trip. It is packed with meetings and events planned as a celebration of the two countries' friendship. But this is a working trip. Biden and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau have a long list of difficult issues to tackle. Migration and defense spending are just to name a couple. And as Ashley Burke tells us, sources say one agreement has already been reached. For the first time in years, a U.S. president arriving in Ottawa. Joe Biden was first greeted by dignitaries and the governor general. Hi. Then headed off to Rideau Cottage to meet with Justin Trudeau. A friendly visit, but even friends have challenges to work out. And before Biden even arrived in the capital, Radio Canada learned the two countries already struck a deal. I hope it's a positive sign of what's to come. Asylum seekers are at the center of the new arrangement. Sources say it's a change to the safe third country agreement. Law enforcement on both sides of the border will be able to turn back migrants if they cross illegally. We don't know what is being proposed exactly. There are some signals that there's a solution. If the solution solves a problem, it's something we're open to. The problem most acute in Quebec at Roxham Road, where there's been a surge in asylum seekers entering from New York. Sources say irregular crossings like this will now be shut down, though some worry what that could mean. I think it's very likely that those who are already traveling, if Roxham Road is no longer available, will either hire smugglers or make the decision to try to cross the border at other points of entry that are less accessible and more dangerous. Sources say as part of the deal, Canada has agreed to accept 15,000 migrants from the Western Hemisphere. The U.S., meanwhile, is pressing Canada to help stem the flow of asylum seekers from Haiti by leading a mission there to combat spiraling gang violence. Trudeau so far resisting. Haiti is a quagmire, and even if we were to send all of our Canadian armed forces there, I'm not sure that we would be able to stabilize a, a country which is essentially a, a failed state. Biden and Trudeau have much more to discuss, including China. The Liberal government getting pummeled over allegations of Chinese government meddling in Canadian elections. And after a Chinese spy balloon flew over the U.S. and Canada, the Americans are looking for Canada to spend more on defense and move faster to update NORAD. So, Ashley, this is day one. That's a lot for day one. But what's on the agenda for Friday? Well, Adrian, there's a lot to talk about and there's not a lot of time. Trudeau is sitting down with Biden for a one-on-one -on -one meeting tomorrow and we'll have a quick chat with the leader of the official opposition, Pierre Polyev. The president will also deliver an address to parliament and attend a dinner with hundreds of dignitaries before Biden and his wife get back on Air Force One and fly home. All right, Ashley Burke, thank you.
Chief political correspondent Rosemary Barton is here with us now. Excellent weather. Thank you. Yeah, it's a beautiful For city. this, allegedly. Yeah. Yes. So this is a very busy visit. Yeah. Uh, can you put some perspective on it, though, in terms of how significant it is? Yeah, I mean, it's hugely significant when a president comes. That hasn't happened for an awfully long time. It's been an even longer time since a president stayed over for 24 hours. And when you talk to officials, they will say to you, listen, it's even beyond that, because mm -hmm. we've spent days and days now talking to people inside the White House. The Roxham Road deal that Ashley told you about out there is very significant. It's also really something that Canadians did not think that they were going to manage to get. Uh, but there was some pressure domestically inside the United States. And then I think there's a broader conversation happening between the two countries around irregular migration on the continent. So this will be viewed as a political win for Justin Trudeau um, from the president because the Conservatives had been pushing for this. And so had the Quebec Premier. Don't forget that. But when you get something, you have to give something. So if this if this is a win for Canada, yeah. ar arguably, what, how does that affect the other issues at stake? Yeah, I think that's what we will have to wait and see uh, tomorrow to, to, to see whether there's been a quid pro quo. We're going to talk about it on that issue as well, obviously. Whether there is now more pressure on Canada to do something in Haiti whether there is more pressure on Canada when it comes to defense spending. That is a big issue for the United States. They are happy with how much Canada is spending in Ukraine. Where they would like to see some progress is around um, the speed at which Canada is devoting money to the modernization of NORAD. That's really important to them, too. So those are some issues I think we'll, we'll see what actually happens tomorrow. But there is another issue, of course, that's preoccupying Ottawa right now, and that is election interference by China. That is also of concern to the Americans. Yep. I think you can expect questions to both leaders on that tomorrow, Adrian. All right, Rosie, thank you. Thanks nice for coming. <laughs> and you'll be back in about 20 minutes with Ad Issue tackling all of this. And that huge issue Rosie was talking about, the allegations of interference by China, that issue continues to grow tonight over the controversy dogging MP Handong. Last night, he quit the Liberal caucus to sit as an independent after a Global News report alleged that back in 2021, he advised a Chinese diplomat to delay the release of detained Canadians Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. So now the opposition parties are using that unproven allegation to hammer the government. Rafi Bujikanian starts us there. All those in favour of the motion will please rise. The opposition parties renewed their push for a public inquiry into foreign interference in Canada's democracy, with support from newly independent MP Han Dong, citing against his former Liberal colleagues. I declare the motion carried. That vote after Global News reported that in 2021, Dong had a conversation with a Chinese diplomat to advise Beijing to delay the release of two Canadians being held in China, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, because freeing them would supposedly help the Conservatives. CBC News has not verified the allegation. The Prime Minister knew that a member of his Liberal caucus was working to, to, to keep two Canadian citizens arbitrarily and illegally incarcerated. The Prime Minister knew very well what was happening to the, to, to the two Michaels and made sure that his government would be standing up against China. Dong says he intends clear. to clear his name. What has been reported is false and I will defend myself. Easier said than done, intelligence experts warn. There's no way that we actually know where this information is from. It's just too anonymous sources. Things just didn't add up. On that this acquaintance of Dong I saying the accusation see. itself is what hard to believe. I just personally do not see what good could it possibly do to him and his own political future. Well, the prime minister didn't directly address the resignation, but he told CNN. We are going to have to continue uh, to be wide eyed and clear about the threat that China poses and wants to pose to the stability of our democracies. That motion calling for an inquiry is non-binding and the government says it wants to give the recently appointed special rapporteur two months to weigh in on recommending one. But increasing pressure still calls for something sooner. Rafi Bujikan, CBC News, Ottawa. South of the border, questions about possible Chinese government interference and surveillance were put to the CEO of TikTok today. He appeared before a U.S. congressional committee over fears the app is a national security threat. Thomas Dagla takes us through the testimony. 
For TikTok's little known chief executive, this was one big day. A high profile appearance on Capitol Hill with the app's future in the U.S. uncertain. We are very excited to be here. There are many misconceptions about our company. Your time For hours, Sho Chu faced an onslaught from U.S. lawmakers. TikTok is a grave threat of foreign influence in American life. With the app's parent company, ByteDance, based in Beijing, Washington fears TikTok could be used to gather intelligence. Has ByteDance spied on American citizens? I don't think the spying is the right way to describe it. But the concerns don't end there. Someone on TikTok threatened to attack this hearing, and it apparently stayed online for 41 days. You expect us to believe that you are capable of maintaining the data security, privacy and security of 150 million Americans where you can't even protect the people in this room? The U.S. is said to be contemplating a national ban on TikTok if the Chinese owners don't sell their stakes. It's a troubling prospect for creators who make a living on the platform. This moisturizer I use all the time. And like I Naomi Lanage from Brampton, Ontario. I think it is important for them to realize that this isn't just an app that's for fun, like it is a lot of people's career. Um, and we are bringing a lot into the economy through it. <laughs> TikTok even paid for dozens of other high profile users to descend upon Capitol Hill and spread the approved message. We could do both. I don't think ownership is the issue here. With a lot of respect, American social companies don't have a good track record with data privacy. Chu's testimony did little to reassure lawmakers. As tensions continue to ramp up between the U.S. and China, TikTok's 150 million users in this country remain caught in the middle. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Washington. In Montreal, two more bodies have been recovered from the charred remains of a building hit last week by a deadly fire. In the late evening yesterday, we were able to locate a third and a fourth victim in the rubble and extricate them from the building. So that leaves three people still missing. A second crane will be deployed to help in the delicate search. Police say the safety of the crew is the top priority as parts of the building are still at risk of collapsing. It's a frustrating fact that there are huge surgery wait lists in this country and a new report now tells us people needing joint replacements are facing some of the longest wait times. Often, they're waiting in real pain. Lauren Pelly now with the very personal cost of being stuck in a backlog. Julia Barbagallo used to lead an active life. Come, Nico. Come, Nico. Let's go for one, big boy. Now, the 55-year-old needs help just to tie her shoes. Oh, yeah. well wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Barbagallo has osteoarthritis and needs a hip replacement. But doctors told her the wait could be more than a year. It's depressing. Um, I have days where I just, I, I just get discouraged and I just cry. New data shows many Canadian patients are still facing longer wait times for surgeries. There were close to 36,000 fewer knee replacements performed up to September 2022 compared to pre-pandemic levels, a 20% drop. Hip replacements weren't far behind, with 12,000 fewer procedures performed during the same period. By last year, at least half of patients were waiting more than six months for either procedure. Many Canadians are also waiting slightly longer for various types of cancer surgery. Last year, in most cases, that delay was around one to three days. But for prostate cancer, many people are seeing delays of up to two weeks. This Toronto surgeon says the surgical backlog at his hospital network is nearing 5,000 patients. We're operating at close to 120% of operating room capacity. We're opening up additional operating rooms on the weekends. That work requires all hands on deck. No easy feat when staff are in short supply. The pandemic has, uh, has had a huge impact on healthcare workers. Quite a few people retired, left, changed uh, profession. Federal funding to the provinces includes $25 billion for key priority areas such as backlogs and staffing. We've got caught off guard. Uh, but that won't instantly solve wait times. Never expected our system to fail us like this. Barbagallo is now considering a faster private surgery at a cost of roughly $30,000. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto.
A chronic health care shortage is just one issue plaguing 11 northern Manitoba First Nations tonight as they declare a regional state of emergency. As I'm talking to you right now, our people are suffering and dying. The Kiwetan Tribal Council says its member communities are reeling from insufficient public safety, health services and infrastructure. Some have already declared emergencies over spiraling drug use, poverty and suicide rates. The council wants both Manitoba and Ottawa to provide immediate support. Now to northern Alberta, where Canadian energy giant Imperial Oil faces angry questions over why it took nine months to reveal a massive tailings pond leak. It was discovered in May of 2022 outside Imperial's Curl Oil Sands project. That's about 70 kilometers north of Fort McMurray. But nobody told local First Nations or government officials until just last month. So when Imperial Oil finally met with community members in Fort Chippewan last night, emotions were high. Julia Wong was there. You're responsible for what's going on right now. Fiery outbursts and tough questions for Imperial Oil. What about our lives here? As people in Fort Chippewan demanded to know why they were not told about an oil sands leak dating all the way back to last spring. A lot of uh, people that are scared. Enough of these false promises. Since May, industrial wastewater containing arsenic, dissolved iron and sulfate has been seeping out of tailing ponds upstream of Fort Chippewan. Residents only learned about it nine months later after another incident where more wastewater overflowed from a water drainage pond. This leak out of Alaska. Federal inspectors say the leaks threaten local wildlife, while residents worry about possible health impacts. This man lives off the land. Me and my wife were sitting there talking and and it hurt us both like for because of our children, eh? You know, it's it's a hard thing. Lots of people have kids in this town and going to drinking the water. Cleanup is underway and the company says it's committed to doing better. We regret the incidents and we're making every effort to ensure we prevent them from happening again. Some were not convinced. I apologize that you didn't like my answer. I did honestly try to answer the questions. Did this meeting make you feel any better? No. Actually, it kind of upset me a little more and it, it uh, resurfaced all the emotions, as you can tell in my voice. No, it didn't. It never will until they solve the issue of the tailing pond. Imperial Oil says it will come back here for another meeting with residents next month. But there are other conversations happening as well between the federal and provincial governments, industry and indigenous leaders to make sure the communication failures that happened here don't happen somewhere else. Julia Wong, CBC News, Fort Chippewan, Alberta. In France tonight, anger is intensifying with a ninth day of nationwide strikes. President Emmanuel Macron says he will not budge on his pension reforms. And as Chris Brown shows us, protesters aren't backing down either. France is convulsing again, fractured over changes to public pensions that would make people work longer to get them. In Paris, tear gas filled the air as protesters, some of them anarchist troublemakers, according to police, set bags of garbage on fire. The city of Rennes looked like a battlefield, so did not. We have to block the country in a strong way that the government cannot ignore the people's will. People will now have to work until they're 64 before drawing a pension, up from 62. Du but the measure was so controversial, Macron's parliamentary allies had to resort to a rare procedural move to force it through without a vote. His government barely survived a no-confidence motion. But in an interview, he was unapologetic. The longer we wait, the worse the situation will get, he said. This parliamentarian represents French citizens living in Canada and the U.S. And he said no one wants to be told they have to work more. This is a country that has a tradition of demonstrations. But if you want to get things done at some point, you have to go, to, um, you have to go through this. 
perhaps, but the demonstrations Thursday were the largest yet. And even though the bill is now law, people are continuing to fight, angered over how Macron rammed it through, says this political scientist. So now it's becoming something very special because it was against that specific pension agenda and it becomes something more institutional, more related to something which is related to democracy. <laughs> Civil unrest, labor strikes and mountains of uncollected garbage have become part of France's political culture. But the economic damage is adding up, with disruptions to airports, trains and many other sectors of the economy. Chris Brown, CBC News, London. After years of investigating the so-called pink tax, CBC's marketplace puts it to the test again. 6 24 caplets. What do you got over there? 24 caplets. $7.49. Two different prices appearing to be based solely on gender. The response of the retailer, plus. This is all so nice and bright and clean, and every, every shelf's just full of stuff. The return of an iconic discount store, Zeller's, is back and open for business. And later. I feel amazing, and it's like a great opportunity for me. This high school student came to Canada as an Afghan refugee. Now she's off to university with the backing of a big award. We're back in two. A reunion today for some shoppers eager for a dose of retail nostalgia. Zellers opened its doors again with customers marching back in after more than a decade. We're just so happy to have and see the red sign with the Zellers on it. It's a place to start, but I hope they grow. It's exciting to just see Zellers back and check everything out again. Twelve locations were opened across the country, including this one east of Toronto. The discount chain plans to open 25 stores and all, each one within locations of the Bay. Now, one of Canada's largest retailers says it will change its prices in the wake of a CBC Marketplace investigation. That investigation found that painkillers marketed to women to relieve menstrual cramps were priced higher than other comparable painkillers with the very same ingredients. And as Charles C. Agro shows us, the so-called pink tax goes much further than that. Coffee. Coffee. Did you take a look at the price? Two fifty for men and three dollars for women. Why is it so so expensive for women? Well, women pay more for lots of stuff. I know, <laughs> that's for sure. At this coffee shop, the same drink has two different prices, and customers aren't impressed with the point this social experiment is trying to make. We have to pay more. I don't like this vibe. What do you think about the fact that you have to pay more for some things than men? It's outrageous. But marketing professor Alivaresu says women continue to pay more than men for lots of products. If they can sell the same item virtually for two different segments and make the price higher for one, then they, they increase their bottom line. It's called the pink tax. Recent data from one Canadian company found, on average, women pay over 50% more for deodorant and body wash marketed to them compared to similar products marketed to men. The price differences tend to be rather small. Over the year and over the course of a consumer's lifetime, they add up. Marketplace found several examples of retailers selling products to women and girls at higher prices than products marketed as gender neutral or to men and boys. Including these painkillers, both identical in size and active ingredients, but at two different prices. Six ninety nine, twenty four caplets. What do you got over there? Twenty four caplets, seven forty nine. In emails to Marketplace, Loblaw, the parent company of Shoppers Drug Mart, where those products were purchased, said it will drop the prices of the menstrual pills to align them with the non-gendered version, in light of its commitment to women's health. What do you guys think, though? Should we be paying more than men? If anything, less, because we get paid less, right? It's tiring. Yeah, to be a woman. <laughs> Agreed. And it's expensive, isn't yes. it? Yes. Yeah. Charles Siagro, CBC News, Toronto. You can check out the full results of Marketplace's investigation on Friday. That's at 8 p.m. on CBC Television, 8.30 in Newfoundland, or stream it on CBC Jam. 
Now, track and field's governing body has voted to change its rules around transgender athletes. World Athletics says athletes who've gone through male puberty before transitioning to female are banned from competition. Swimming adopted a similar rule last year. The organization says the moves are an effort to protect the female category. After the break, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, Rosie. Hi again, Adrian. Tonight we are going to talk about those allegations surrounding Handong and election interference. I have informed the Prime Minister and the leadership of the Liberal Party caucus that I will be sitting as an independent. What does the resignation mean for those calls for a public inquiry? Chantal Althea, Andrew and Alex Panetta join me to talk about that and more. Hi there, I'm Rosemary Barton. Here's what's at issue this week. I have informed the Prime Minister and the leadership of the Liberal Party caucus that I will be sitting as an independent. MP Han Dong's surprising resignation from Liberal caucus after Global News reported that he allegedly advised a Chinese official to delay the release of Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig. Dong has denied these allegations and says he intends to clear his name, but his resignation has prompted more calls for a public inquiry. It has become very clear now with allegations coming out on a daily basis that are continuing to erode people's confidence in our democracy that we need a public inquiry. So what's to be made of this resignation? How does this affect the calls for a public inquiry? Let's bring in everybody. Chantelle Bear, Althea Raj, Andrew Coyne, and joining us tonight, our Washington uh, correspondent, senior correspondent, Alex Panetta, who's in Canada for the, the big visit, which we will get to. But we, we <laughs> want to start with this news because it is um, significant and, and, a, and a pretty big deal for the government. And Chantelle, I'll start with you. How surprising was this to you? And what do you think this does to the story and the government's attempt to manage the story? Okay, there are uh, many moving parts in your question. First of all, I think it's probably proper to talk about allegations rather than revelations. That's right. Why do I say that? Because the, this story is based on anonymous sources that would be associated with the security services, but we don't know who exactly they are and how solid uh, their information is, for one. For two, we have recent experience that uh, suggests caution uh, when looking at intelligence material, is very recent. Uh, mm -hmm. And the leaks that came from the security services about uh, what uh, justified uh, him ending up tortured uh, in Syria. And, uh, of course, the 20th anniversary this week of the war on Iraq and the quest for weapons of mass destruction. So it's not just small countries with funky security services mm -hmm. that sometimes throw in false information into the mix. Big boys and big girls also do it. What does it do to the story? I think it almost makes inevitable the holding of a public inquiry. Mm -hmm. It has given the issue momentum, uh, if it ever needed any. Uh, I can't see how David Johnston, if he goes to uh, May 23rd to make a recommendation, could uh, avoid recommending a public inquiry. Yeah, I, I wonder too, Althea, whether that's sort of what the government would almost be hoping for at this stage, because obviously things need to be uh, put on the table so that we understand, as, as Chantal says, the pieces we know or we think we know and the pieces that we don't know um, and understand what's, what's real in all of it. Yeah, I mean, I will start off, I guess, with a note of caution, like Chantal. Like, I really hope that my media colleagues are getting this right, because I was... Uh, so moved by Han Dong breaking down uh, in the House of Commons as he did last night when he was talking to his family members. Like, if this man is lying, give him an Oscar because that was a great performance. Um, you really feel like his world is, is shattering. And I hope that the sources whose intelligence the global report is based on um, are is accurate uh, because somebody's reputation has been completely torn to tatters and I don't know how he manages to put how he gets to manage to, to put the pieces together with regards to the public inquiry uh, I feel like so many people believe that this is the answer and I'm not 
I feel like even if we get a public inquiry, they will be disappointed because this mm -hmm. information, if this is based on wiretap information as we believe that it likely is uh, from the, the Consul General in, in Toronto, um, that's not going to be discussed out in the open. You know, there will be very little information publicly discussed. So we will have to wait uh, for the commissioner to come out and people will have to believe that what happened behind closed doors was a fair, legitimate process that shed light. I just, I don't know if we will have more questions rather than answers at the end of all of this. Andrew? Uh, I'll also say we should be skeptical, but skepticism shouldn't edge into denial. If you watch some of the reaction online, people either wanted to arrest him forthwith or they said this is an utter travesty and a, and a calumny on a good man. I don't think we know either of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we do know is it's not only his reputation that's on the line, but so is the reputation of Global and the reporter in question. And people need to understand that news organizations take these things pretty seriously and they don't just throw out allegations without, you know, just for kicks. This would have been checked sideways, you know, up, down, and sideways and lawyered and everything else. Doesn't mean it's necessarily right. But it does mean it's credible enough that we should take it seriously and would, should want to know more. And that's what I think it seems to me everybody should be able to agree on is uh, there's obviously something out there we need to learn more about. A public inquiry may be the best way of getting at it, but certainly, again, I'll repeat this point. What we really need to know is what was known inside the government about all of this and what was done or not done about any of it. Alex, obviously you're you're a U.S. reporter, but you're following this because the concerns around China um, obviously exist in the United States as well. Well, I was going to say that if this story is accurate, it's one of the great scandals in Canadian political history. If this story is inaccurate, it's one of the great scandals in Canadian political history. And 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 uh, the the uh, the Washington context here is 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 quite striking. I mean, to have this story break. Uh, and to be on the front pages of newspapers in the hotels where uh, American guests will be staying uh, is pretty bad timing uh, for the government, very awkward, because I, I could not stress enough the extent to which the United States is obsessed with China right now. J just for context, today, uh, the, uh, President Biden's visit to Canada is not a big story in the United States. Mm -hmm. What is happening on Capitol Hill today are three Count them three hearings related to China. There's the TikTok hearing, the uh, CEO of the social media company, where they're looking at banning TikTok. There's uh, something on Uyghur genocide happening on Capitol Hill. And uh, they're looking at um, uh, a third, uh, there's a third China investigation happening as well. So all these things are happening at the same time. And it just shows you that the United States is just, it, it dominates every single conversation about policy and is a, a matter of bi, uh, bipartisan uh, concern there. So now Canada's you know, made the news there probably for reasons it wishes it hadn't. Chantal. Uh, we have also uh, been increasingly dominated by the China question. Let's not forget that uh, the, the, the two Michaels were not brought home uh, 10 years ago. That mm -hmm. just happened and it overshadowed uh, Justin Trudeau's not only his, his China policy, but his term in office as prime minister. It was part and parcel of it, which is part of the reason why the story about uh, this MP is difficult to get one's head around. Uh, mm -hmm. What liberal MP would not think that it would be a good day on any day of the week for the two Michaels to come home? Uh, a good day for the government. But setting that aside, the U.S. has chimed in to our story via the ambassador. Uh, and I'm sorry to mention a competitor, but in a CTV interview, uh, which uh, ambassadors do not give unless they have a message. Uh, the message from the U.S. ambassador to Canada was, what matters is that the inter interference work. And in my book, he said it didn't work. Uh, yeah. So uh, those attempts were all living with them. I thought it was interesting because that interview came in the middle of this discussion, but also in the lead up to the presidential visit. Uh, last word to you on this, Andrew. I'm not sure I agree with the ambassador that the only thing that matters is whether they actually worked or not. If people are trying to rob your bank, uh, it's not really uh, hugely uh, um, you know, reassuring to know that, well, they didn't succeed this time, but they're still, gonna, they're still trying. Uh, there's clearly a large-scale operation out there. That's not in contention. We've been talking about this for years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and so far, we've been able to withstand it. But I think we need to, to be sure that our, our defenses are secure. Okay, we're going to take a short break. Good, good thoughts from all of you. We'll be back with another round of that issue and talk about, of course, the big news in town, that President Biden has arrived for this official meeting with the Prime Minister. What progress might they make or have they already made on some big issues or irritants? That's next on The National.
Welcome back to another round of that issue. Joe Biden has arrived in Ottawa for his official meeting with the Prime Minister. The President and Prime Minister are set to discuss a number of topics during the visit, including defence spending, Haiti and the border. Radio Canada has confirmed a deal has been reached to close the Roxham Road irregular crossing. In return, Canada will allow 15,000 more migrants to enter legally. So what other problems might get solved in this visit? How important is it? Let's bring everyone back. Chantal, Althea, Andrew, and joining us tonight, Alex Panetta. Alex, let's start with you because you uh, you helped confirm some of these details first reported by our, our friend Louis Blouin. But um, th the fact that there is, seems to be a deal, obviously they still have to sign it tomorrow, but uh, that seems to me to be a, a big deal <laughs> because it was something Canada was uh, looking for, for sure. It's for years. These talks were yeah. dormant. I, I was talking to someone today who said, had you asked me, someone very involved in this, uh, said, if you asked me a month ago, I would have said this would not happen. It would never happen. Uh, I spoke just a few weeks ago with people from the United States and Canada saying these things were going nowhere. And, and contextually, it's important to keep in mind the United States, when it hears that Canada is having a problem with thousands of uh, asylum <laughs> seekers, it's like, well, sorry, we're talking millions, you know, three extra zeros uh, uh, in the United States. And, and you know, they could have said, poor little pumpkin, you can't handle a small little um, a spike in migration in the midst of a historic worldwide phenomenon. Uh, but they didn't say that. Apparently, they, 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 took, they took this request from Canada to negotiate this in, the, in advance of President Biden's trip quite seriously. And my understanding is, barring some spectacular uh, reversal or last minute snafu, uh, there's going to be an announcement tomorrow uh, to extend the safe third country agreement across the border um, in exchange for, as you correctly noted, uh, uh, Canada taking in an additional 15,000 migrants from the Western uh, Hemisphere. And it should take effect within uh, days, potentially. And, and that, Chantal, will certainly make, I, I think, the Quebec premier quite happy because he is the one that's been struggling with this problem the most. Yes, uh, for sure. It, it, we're not so much closing Roxham Road as allowing uh, the RCMP and the police to turn back people who show up at Roxham Road and uh, ending this, this fast way to get into Canada irregularly. Uh, it's more, uh, I think President Biden found some cover in the more recent focus on people going the other way from Canada to the U.S., which allows him to say, well, I've plugged the border. But I'm, it is, at the end of the day, more of a gift to Justin Trudeau than, than a win for Joe Biden. And I'm curious to see when the meetings end, whether we have traded something in exchange, like mm -hmm. acceptance mm -hmm. uh, on 80 to lead a multinational force in that country, yeah. which we've been reluctant to do. But I, I am convinced that the quid pro quo extends beyond accepting 15,000 more migrants uh, from South uh, uh, and the American uh, continent. Yeah, I, I would I would imagine you're quite right, Chantal. Andrew, what, what, what would you imagine, well, first of all, the deal, but what would you imagine could be on the table for what the United States might be able to get out of Canada? Uh, I don't know. I think Chantal is absolutely right that 15,000 uh, migrants from Mexico seems like a fairly small price to be paid for resolving such a problem. I guess my question is, how much does this actually resolve? Mm -hmm. uh, so we're, the, the, the premise here is that we can patrol a 5,000-mile border. You know, people are showing up at Roxham Road because they were turned back at the official crossing points. If they're no longer going to be allowed to cross at Roxham Road, presumably they're going to cross somewhere else. Only now we won't know who they are, where they are, which may, to be cynical, maybe part of the point is that at least they'll be off the front pages. We, we won't know where they are, but they won't be clogging up Roxham Road and, and creating, you know, upsetting images on the nightly news. So there's the enforceability question. There's also the question of... Uh, how long is the safe third country agreement going to be uh, legal in Canada? Because there are court challenges out there, and we may well find eventually when it gets to the Supreme Court uh, that this gets thrown out as being not constitutional because we can't necessarily be sure that the United States is indeed a safe third country. Uh, and that ultimately, as long as there's this gap in reality or perception between how migrants are treated in Canada and how they're treated in the United States, then I think we're always going to have this problem with us. Althea? Yeah, well, the Supreme Court has already heard the case, but we don't have a date on when they're going to actually yeah. issue their ruling. But um, Andrew's very quite right. It will take the issue away from the front pages, at least um, in Quebec, in the sense that the, that number of 15,000 will be spread across official border crossings and will not cause uh, great images uh, to arise in people's supper hour uh, newscast. Um, I'm not 
I don't quite think that I would be very surprised, I guess I should say, if uh, the Canadian government agrees to lead a multinational force in Haiti. I don't I think there's going to be an outcome in Haiti. That's what we've been told from both sides of the border. Um, but that would be very surprising. I think maybe what we've traded is a lot more defense spending. There's been a lot of talk from the Americans about wanting us to spend more money on NORAD modernization. Um, it's great that we're buying F-35s, but the infrastructure in the Arctic is not uh, up to par in order to have F-35s guys up there. Um, so we know that there's going to be a lot of announcements. They have been working on this for weeks. Action-oriented announcement is what they told us. Um, but I think just taking a step back, I think the story that is going to come out tomorrow is really about the friendships between mm. these two men and, and, and how positive that has been for Canada. And the Safe Third Country Agreement is proof of that. Though, though not not a quote unquote bromance as as the way the the Trudeau Obama uh, relationship was depicted, Alex, and certainly not a relationship without without issues, um, because Biden is you know he wants to presumably become president again. Absolutely, and so I, I want to pick up on something Chantal said. She talked yeah. about the Republicans making an issue of migration from Canada. I think they may have unwittingly um, or unintentionally led to this agreement. I think they created political space for Joe Biden to say. Yes, to Canada on this. And, and he'll be able to now say, look, I closed the Canadian border. You've been complaining about hundreds or thousands of migrants from Canada. I've, I've shut that off. And but, but I have to say, Biden himself, through the course of his presidency, there, some Canadians will disagree that he's been good for Canada because they'll, you know, depending on your priorities, they'll say he canceled the Keystone Pipeline. You may disagree with that and think it was a, a terrible decision. But recently, in the last in the last year, he has I won't say expended political capital because these aren't huge issues in the United States. I'll say he's risked political capital because they could become issues in the United States twice for Canada on that electric vehicle tax credit. Yeah. Uh, Buy American policies are exceptionally popular. He got a bipartisan standing ovation during the State of the Union address talking about Buy uh, by American issues. He's now said, I'll make an exception for Canada and Mexico. And lately, it might also be Europe, but depending on how the regulations are written. So he did Canada a favor there. More recently, I don't think this thing is a political winner necessarily for him. As a matter of fact, it's probably a lot more risk than reward. Yet he's done Canada a solid, or at least done the Canadian government a solid because it was asking for this. So, uh, yeah, I'd say Biden uh, over the last year has, has, has taken a risk twice on issues important to, uh, to the Canadians. Chantal? I think the vast majority of Canadians, based on polls, feel that he's in any way totally better than the alternative or his recent predecessor. I think that's a no contest. Canada has always uh, been more uh, favorable to Democrat presidents. And I think that holds true for Biden. I'm not so sure that it was that big a give to Canada, uh, the, the, the move on uh, allowing Canada and Mexico to be part of the, the yeah. e-vehicle uh, umbrella in the sense that those are integrated uh, manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the pressures to do that were coming from the United States and, and car makers in the United States and the industry in the U.S. as much as from Canada. But I also think we've upped our game over the Trump years yeah. and we no longer just rely on bromances to advance our files. Thank you all. That was a good uh, prep for the, the big day tomorrow. Good to have you here, Alex, and good to see everyone else. I'll see the three of you for the budget on Tuesday. Now I'll send things back to Adrienne, and she, of course, is just down the street from me here in Ottawa. Thanks, Rosie. Just ahead, a young woman who knows a challenge. Her life changed when she fled to Canada as an Afghan refugee. Now a major award is about to change her life again. Our moment is next. This young superstar is 20-year-old Benin Argeman. She is one of 36 winners of Canada's prestigious Loran Award. It includes a scholarship valued at $100,000. So that's a pretty stunning achievement when you realize that just 18 months ago, she came to Canada as a refugee from Afghanistan. Her win and her compassion for the young women she left behind is our moment. <sighs> I feel amazing, and it's like a great opportunity for me. The award itself is Laran Scholarship. Doing that application reminds me of what I did and like reminds me of back home, Afghanistan. I remember I ended up crying after like each part of application that I did because, yeah, it is hard for me to like think about all of those 
again and again and over and over. My biggest hope for girls in Afghanistan is their education, their safety, and also their freedom. They are not able to do what they want in society as a woman. They cannot go outside. It's life in prison. And women are not allowed to go to university or high school. Why? Is that fair? And like, that's, that's my hope. Some, one day it gets better and one day we, we could have freedom in our country and peace. Good for you, Benin. Congratulations. So uh, Benin is, was one of 4,800 applicants. She says she is probably going to be studying international development or political science. Well done. That is The National for Thursday, March 23rd. Good night from a foggy Ottawa. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you tomorrow.